uh, Robert Coase. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, on the east side near St. John's Hospital. Born in the 1950s, mm -hmm. it was quiet, peaceful, and we all got along very well with one another. Well, my family, I have one sister, but she died when she was six or seven days old. And she was born 10 years before I was born. Wow. So I never met her. She's my angel in heaven. So I have Dorothy looking after me in heaven. Great-grandparents came from Germany, the same area that Pope uh, Benedict is from. And uh, they grew up in Detroit. And my mom and dad met, I think, at St. Joseph's Church in downtown, on J Street in downtown Detroit. Well, I went to St. Claire Montefalco School. I was an only child, and my mother died when I was 10 years old. So my dad and my aunt raised me from the age of 10. Well, I think I grew up in a very Catholic family. We, my folks always went to Mass every Sunday. And first Sunday of every month, we were going down to the monastery on Mount Elliot and go for the 6 a.m. Mass. And so you can imagine a young child of six, seven, eight, nine years old getting up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday to go to church. So I, that's how I got to know the Capuchins since I was a child. I well, have always been interested in, in the Capuchins. So the fact that of going to masses down there on Sunday, as long as I can remember. And uh, my final year of high school, I went to St. Francis Brothers School in Mount Calvary. And then from there, enter the Protestancy. I've been blessed being at Mission Santé Nes in Solvang for the last four years after our house was closed in uh, Tucson because of the lack of personnel. Blessed to be able to come here. I, Previously was in Tucson for 14 years, and our house closed at that time about four years ago. And Brother Mike Sullivan offered me the opportunity of coming out here. And uh, I just feel like I've been so blessed because I had been visiting here for previously over 20 years. So it was sort of like coming home because I knew a lot of the people in, in the parish. And uh, this inspired by their generosity and by their uh, ability to give praise and thanks to God through their spiritual life and also through their ability to just volunteer their time and their effort to all the uh, activities that go on at the parish, at the mission. This is something I felt the call of God in my life as long as I can remember. There was never any other vocation that I felt called to. My first ministry assignment was at St. Francis Parish in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I worked as a parish receptionist in the front office. Oh, I have been at St. Francis for 23 years. It's very interesting how God works in different ways in, in people's lives. I just reflected on how Jesus called the 12 apostles. Each one of them had a, a different lifestyle. Most of them were fishermen but he called them at different times in their lives to, to follow him. And I guess I felt my call ever since I, I was a child and had a special attraction to, to St. Francis, perhaps from my parents going down to St. Bonaventure Monastery in Detroit once a month since my childhood. And uh, after I finished our Capuchin novitiate in Berrigan, Michigan, I was assigned to St. Francis Parish in Milwaukee, where I was the um, parish secretary, you might say office receptionist, the person in the front office who, who greeted people and uh, welcomed them when they came to visit the, uh, the brothers at the monastery. And I think all this led to a development of, of interest in the Spanish language because I would answer the phone for Father Wilbert Lancer, who was the associate pastor and pastor at that time. And people were calling. I had no way of telling them that Father wasn't in, 
and so forth. And so I thought, well, I want to start school and just learn a little bit of Spanish, so at least so that I can have the common courtesy of welcoming them in their own language. And I think that just developed into a whole lifetime ministry that has lasted to this present day, some 59 years later. <laughs> well, I think the Holy Spirit has been working in my life in many different ways, encouraging me, calling my attention to listen to what other people say. You know, many times when I was at the office at, at St. Francis, people would say, have you ever thought of becoming a priest? We see these qualities in you, and I said, no, I, I never thought of that. I don't have the education for that. We went to technical school when we were in formation, but nothing that would be along the lines of philosophy or, or theological preparation. As a, and I always thought that was something that I was not qualified to do. Well, I think the encouragement of the people saying that they saw qualities in, in me that would be of more service to, to the church and to our Capuchin community. I think that led me to ordination as a deacon to study with the diocese, the Archdiocese of Milwaukee in their permanent diaconate program. At that time, I had no intention of becoming a priest, but I thought that I would be called to serve as a permanent deacon. Mm -hmm. And then that led me to ministry as a volunteer chaplain at St. Mary's Hospital in Milwaukee, and also at the Milwaukee County Jail with Al Vike. We, where I worked for 10, 10 years. We would have uh, community services on, on Sunday. I would go in during the week to visit with the uh, in, inmates who wanted to uh, talk to a chaplain or just make myself known that I was there in case they wanted to speak to someone. And I think the way they shared their life, people who really searching for God, really looking for that purpose in their own life, and some of the times they would share with me their, their own personal confessions. And as a deacon, I was unable to give them absolution. So I would say, well, I'm sure God forgives you your sins, but I will call a priest to give you sacramental absolution. And I think this is what sort of inspired me to say, perhaps I am called, and maybe I need to take that risk to jump out into waters that might not be so calm. <laughs> I think the most important quality for a priest is, is to be compassionate, to be understanding, to take people where they are at, invite a person to grow, to help that person to become the best that they can possibly be, and never to make judgments about people, because we never know where that person is at in their own personal lives. We may feel that from meeting a person, we know something about them, but we really don't know what is going on inside of them. And as a priest, especially or as a Capuchin, as a brother, we are not here to judge anyone. I always like the words of Pope Francis, who am I to judge? Because we do not know what is going on in the heart and the minds of other people. Our role as, as, as brothers, as Capuchins, as priests, is to invite people to meet God, to be open to God's Holy Spirit, to let God hopefully speak through me to bring them or speak through us as Capuchins by our way of life to bring them closer to God. I think in about six years, we were at the maternity of the Blessed Virgin Mary Parish in, in Chicago. And I was there for six years following my ordination to the priesthood. In Chicago, we had four, three or four, sometimes five Capuchins that ministering to a tricultural parish, uh, elderly Polish, African American, and Hispanic, Mexican and Puerto Rican. The community in Chicago is very involved in housing. Uh, one of our parishes in St. Uh, Maternity of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Chicago was on the housing efforts for, for the city and encourage the parish to become involved in the needs of the local neighborhood. Well, I came to Arizona 
after a combined 23 years in at uh, St. Francis Parish in Milwaukee. I was there first three, uh, three, for three years, another time for 10 years as a deacon, and another 10 years as a priest. So after that time, I was, every winter I was becoming depressed. I was getting uh, pneumonia and bronchitis, and I would come out here to visit, and all my symptoms would, would disappear. And I come back to Milwaukee and every year it was getting worse and worse and worse. And the doctor says, well, one way to solve that is to go move to a warmer climate. And we had our house in Arizona and I was able to transfer to Casa San Jose in Tucson, Arizona in 2006. In Arizona, there were five of us and we worked in different parishes. Um, I worked for some time at the cathedral, helping Father Gonzalo Viegas, uh, and also we spent time helping out in the mission in Rio Rico, which is near the Mexican border, about well, 60 miles south of Tucson. And I would go down there every Sunday Father Nicholas Whitham would have the English Masses and I would have the Spanish Masses. And we did that for about a period of 10 years. Oh, I enjoyed Tucson, yes, very much. And still stay in very close contact with the people there. and They have been very good to me. Well, at Mission Santa Ines, we always start the morning around quarter to seven with a prayer. And we have Mass at eight o'clock. And um, we try to just have a pick-up breakfast or, or lunch each day and have our main meal in, in the evening and we have prayer time in the afternoon before, before supper. The house in Arizona was open for about 20 years, perhaps 21 or 22 years. It was originally the idea to have the friars that came back from, from the missions that they could come to a, a warm climate. However, after 20 some years, there weren't that many people that were volunteering to come out to, Cal, uh, to Arizona. And the uh, age of the friars. I was the youngest at the, in 2006, I was the youngest at age 75. Father Franklin was close to 90. So there was the need to realized that we could not keep that facility going. We could not continue helping in the Diocese of Tucson as we wish we could have continued doing. So that's when Brother Mike Sullivan, who was provincial at the time, offered me the opportunity of, of coming over here because they were looking for someone to help with the Hispanic ministry here at Mission Santa Ines by taking time for prayer. That's why I think our, our morning prayer is so important. We have time to look over the gospel, at least the daily gospel, at least the day before, and to see what message the Holy Spirit is taking from that particular gospel message and how that can be applied to our situation in the parish at this particular time. The best advice that I can offer to the young men who are entering novitiate this year is just to be open to the voice of God. Be open to how the Holy Spirit is leading you, how you feel the Lord is calling you to serve him after the, the example of our Father Francis. The voice of God, I think, is that inner feeling you have within yourself of what you feel that the Lord is calling you to do. God certainly doesn't offer us a physical voice. But I think he talks to us through our soul. He talks to us through moments of, of silence. And that's why the novitiate year stresses so much time upon silence that a person is able to delve into themselves to be able to really know what they are committing themselves to, that they want to follow their poverty, chastity, and obedience in the spirit of Francis. And that they are prepared for that by being able to reflect upon scripture 
reflect upon Capuchin tradition, re reflect upon Franciscan history. And the novitiate year is a time to delve into that before you become involved in studies and in other ministerial tasks. I have seen the hand of God working not only in my own life, but also in the life of so many other people. And I think it has shown me that I need, as a minister, as a, as a brother, as a Capuchin, as a follower of Francis, to walk with other people, to show them that I care about them and that I see the person of God in each and every person that I come in contact with that God is hopefully using me as that, that instrument of reaching out to others. But reaching out to others as a brother in a compassionate way, in an understanding way, that invites them, again, to grow and to be the kind of person that God is calling them to be. Because if a Capuchin is not compassionate, if a Capuchin is not un understanding, then we are not life-giving to someone else. I would hope that people would remember me as a person who cared about them, as a loving and caring Capuchin that reached out to them and made God's presence visible to them through my deeds, through my actions, and through my interactions with them.